Today we will be talking about frequency response curves and what they all mean. I use a lot of frequency response curves when I test speakers and setups. So I thought I should give a bit of a primer on what this is so that you can appreciate my work better. In very simple terms, before I get into the details, it means that if I play a tone of 50 Hz, 50 Hz is being created by the speaker and I record and measure 50 Hz. Let's go into the details today. Having set up this channel for quite a couple of months already, I figured that content creation takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, or actually quite a lot of it. I remain committed to share as much as I know about wireless audio with my viewers out there, but I put a schedule to it so that you know what to expect when you join my channel and be part of my journey. Now, I'll produce two videos a week. The first video will drop on a weekday in the middle of the week, maybe Wednesday or Thursday, when I won't have the time to dedicate to testing equipment or anything that requires extensive setup and placement and testing. I will likely be sharing my opinions on related matters, or it could be educational, where I share my knowledge on audio, especially wireless audio. The second video that I'll drop will be on a weekend, and that should be when I have a couple of hours to test out some equipment or set up some extensive tests to answer some difficult questions that my viewers will have. For example, I might be getting my Sonos 5 speakers soon, but I'll need to wait till the weekend before I can set them up and conduct some full-on tests and evaluation on the speakers. Remember, in my channel, I test everything exhaustively, so you can be assured that you get the results and answers that you deserve. So if this format of my channel appeals to you, do leave a like for this video. If you have comments on the format, please feel free to drop a comment in the comment section below. If you are not part of this community already, do consider subscribing and look forward to more exciting content on this channel. Today, I'll kickstart the new format with a sharing session on frequency response for sound systems and how I use it to conduct my tests to quantify my findings for you. Now, when we do a frequency response curves, what we usually do is to get the speaker to output a frequency signal and then we measure it. But we won't do it for just one frequency, we do it for a range of frequencies and this is what we call a frequency sweep. For a system to produce sound, we need three basic components. First is the source, second is the amplification, and third is the speaker. Now let's take a look at each of these components one at a time. The source, since the beginning of audio reproduction, has been the one to see the most changes. At the source, there are two parts to it, the medium and the player. Depending on how long you've been walking this earth, you might be familiar with retro sound formats or mediums like the vinyl or the cassette tapes. These are your analog sources and they produce sound via mechanical or magnetic encoding. A vinyl record can in theory hold frequency ranges all the way from 7 Hz to 50 kHz. A well-cut record can technically surpass the response offered by, say, a CD, which is 20 Hz to 20 kHz. Now let's avoid the topic of superiority of formats today, as that's likely to divide quite a lot of viewers. Now, when CDs came about, the digital format drew some flag, as there was a hard frequency bandwidth it could deliver, which is 20 Hz to 20 kHz. There was some resistance to the format initially, but ultimately, the convenience of the format brought the world over. There were a few other variants of the format after, including the SACD, the DVD audio, as well as the HD CD. Today, we are into digital formats, which can be stored easily, stored on very small thumb drives, or streamed over the internet. Regardless of the format, each of these mediums carry frequency and amplitude information, which translates into the music that you hear. Now, when you record a frequency range into the medium, whichever medium, you want the frequency range to be delivered back hertz for hertz accurately. This part of the chain is actually pretty accurate and well controlled. You can be quite sure that if you record 1 kHz at minus 10 dB volume, it will be stored and transmitted at 1 kHz minus 10 dB volume. The next part of the source is the player. This is where things start to deviate a little bit. A good phono stage 
or a bad DAC, digital to analog converter, might render the frequency a little bit differently. That 1 kHz signal might no longer be rendered into a 1 kHz sound before it gets passed to the amplifier. A cheap cartridge on your record player might not be able to track the groove on your LP properly. Your streamer might have a low quality DAC which converted the 1 kHz signal to something else altogether. But in general, the variance at this stage is pretty low. The next component is that of the amplifier. The signal that comes out of your source is a low-level signal. This low-level signal carries very little power and it doesn't actually have the grunt to drive the speakers which are basically large magnets that require electricity to move the cones which then moves the air to produce the sound that reaches your ear and you hear them. The low-level signal needs to be amplified and a high-level signal then produced to power the speakers. But before that, there's a pre-amplification stage. Some amplifiers have equalizers built in. In the case of Sonos speakers, you have a treble and a bass control. It changes the sound. It increases the amplitude of the frequency that you want to hear more of. Even if there aren't controls, the M at this stage itself shapes the sound and creates a sound signature that the manufacturer thinks is good for the sound and therefore you will buy it. The stage is a noisy one. It creates a lot of variances in the frequency response. And not only that, what most people may not know is that the amplifier actually has two jobs. The first job is to move the cone. The second job is to actually stop the cone. If you're just moving the cone, it will vibrate, but it will also have residual vibration. This muddles the sound. So if you want to send a 1 kHz signal and you can't stop the cone, the cone will produce residual sounds. This will be most evident in lower frequencies where the cone movement is large and carries a lot of energy and it becomes very hard for an amplifier to stop that mass of cone. A common measurement for amplifier is power, which we are all quite familiar with. But a less common measurement is damping factor. The damping factor is one which I value even above power rating. Damping factor simply determines the ability of the amp to control the cones and to stop the cone on a dime to ensure that there's no further distortion from the residual sound waves to the sound. There are many other factors to consider for amplification, but we won't go through everything in detail today. Suffice to say that at this stage, the frequency has a much higher chance to get distorted. The third and the final stage is that of the speaker. As I've mentioned above, the speaker is a magnet, which based on the electrical impulses it receives from the amp, moves a cone to produce sound. Ideally, a perfect speaker receives an instruction to produce 1 kHz from the amplifier and it sounds out 1 kHz so that your ears pick up 1 kHz. But no, at this particular stage, many more factors come into play. For one, the crossover in the speaker, it has to mess around with the signal. It has to redirect the high frequencies to the tweeters and the lower frequencies to the woofers. The crossover network itself introduces its own coloration. The speaker cabinet, for another, introduces resonance to the sound that is being produced by the cones. When the cones throw out the sound waves, the sound waves then get bounced around your room before it reaches your ears. The bouncing doesn't happen just once, it happens a few times until the energy gets absorbed and dissipated. And everything gets overlapped. The speaker, by far, will be the stage of sound reproduction that will create the most variation in the frequency reproduction. Now that you understand how sound is being reproduced, you will know about all the many opportunities that a sound wave can and is being affected. When I do testing in my videos, I always compare frequency response curves of speakers or in different situations. For example, I will turn TruePlay on a Sonos speaker on and I will use frequency response curves to measure the sound and how that setting affects the sound. Or I will place a speaker in a different position and it changes how the sound is being delivered and I use frequency response curves to measure the difference to see and visualize the difference between the two placements. Different speakers also have different capabilities. For most speakers, they will produce up to 20 kHz without much of a fanfare. Some speakers do go much higher and will use ribbon tweeters or diamond coated tweeters and claim much 
higher frequency response. At the lower end of the base spectrum, the size of the woofer continues to determine how low the speaker can go. The power of the magnet behind that big woofer and the cabinet design and port implementation will also determine the frequency response of the said speaker. Now all this can sound very confusing and you might not want to care much about it. You want only one thing. If the frequency, if a sound is recorded at X hertz, you want to hear it reproduced at X hertz. In the frequency response sweep, what I do is usually to broadcast a signal sweep all the way from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz at a fixed volume for every frequency. When I record it, the ideal source with the ideal M through an ideal speaker in an ideal room will produce a frequency response curve that looks completely flat without any boosts or dips in the curves. Now that is a great speaker, capable of producing anything perfectly when you give it the right instruction. But let me show you a sample curve of what we usually end up hearing. You see all sorts of peaks and valleys. Most of these are going to be created by your room or mine in this case. It is not ideal. We don't live in a recording studio where everything is quiet, our air conditioner is humming away, our glass window is reflecting the high frequencies and is muddling it up there. The corners are bouncing off the low frequencies and allowing it to build up and pull in the corners before throwing it out in a mess. The placement of the speakers and the size of the room creates waves that cancels out some of the bass itself. There are so many factors that will cause a frequency response curve to look like the Himalayas rather than a nice Tibetan plateau. So when I get around to comparing speakers or setups, always remember I'm comparing relative curves. I remove most of the variables where I can, but I won't be able to remove everything. So some of the factors that will cause the peaks and the valleys, including my room, you just have to see everything in a relative manner. I don't compare the curves that the manufacturers put up, and I don't have the equipment nor the environment to recreate those nice flat curves. I am just like you, an average consumer in a typical listening environment trying to get the most out of the systems that we spend our money on to best enjoy our music and soundtrack. Now, if you think this works for you, do consider subscribing to my channel and we can start to explore wireless audio in a way that we everyday consumers listen to music, which is in a living room or your bedroom. It's not in a recording studio, not in a measurement room in a manufacturer's lab. I hope to have given you a bit of insight on sound reproduction and how I do my work in producing my videos for you. Over the next two weeks or so, I would have completed a round of testing for most of Sonos' newest 2020 offerings, including the Sonos Up, which is an Atmos-capable soundbar, the Sonos Sub Gen 3, and the Sonos 5s. Next up, we'll be moving to more exciting offerings from competitors, and I hope to cover more exciting wireless audio offerings in the months to come. Now we live in exciting times and there's no other time I would want to be in. The wireless audio world is growing tremendously and I invite you to join me in the journey to discover more great sounds. Take care and I'll see you in my next video.